In the past few years, a group of scientists have been experimenting with Buddhist monks in a project called Mind and Life. These neuroscientists share a common goal with the Buddhists, namely to understand the nature of the mind. With meditation, Buddhists have developed a set of training procedures that are designed to improve the mind. This timely encounter between Buddhism and science is encouraged by the Dalai Lama. The scientists, on the other hand, are challenged by the resonant parallels between modern physics and the premonitions formulated by the Buddhist thinkers on the inconsistency of matter. The same challenge motivates psychologists to understand elaborate Buddhist theories of the mind. The scientists studying meditative states are pioneers in their field. They try to understand the mechanisms by which the mind influences the body and explore the extraordinary plasticity of the brain. Yeah, they're always improvising at some point. Yeah, maybe the devil is just on vacation. Yeah. Okay. We're going to have you in there for a fairly long stretch. Yeah. I mean, longer than, yes. I mean, not longer than we've ever done, but, you know, at the long end. And so, needless to say, if you start feeling like you're uncomfortable or you've just... No, it's just, uh, no, it's not that. It's just, uh, you know, invo involuntary movements. So, I mean, you I, tell I, us I if, if it feels how like... How do you do with the balloon? So, to, to we just have a, just a, 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 a pillow. So you don't do a, a, a ball no. inflating balloon? No. <laughs> you don't mean, no, I, I hate that no, thing. No, I said, no, I said, no way. No, no, no. <laughs> it will begin with a 30-second period where you're going to be cued to go into one of your, either one of two meditative states or be in a neutral state. So we'll use the words neutral, focused, or open presence. If I see all the instructions will, the come, words in words. will come up, yep, then you will do whatever it is that you do to transition into either the, the right. focused attentional... Right. Right. You, are these words clear to you at which, which yes, state I mean? Yes, okay. Alright, Lee, I think we're ready for magnetic screening. Mathieu Ricard is a former biologist. He lives in Kathmandu and has been practicing Buddhism for over 30 years. He is one of the first monks to collaborate with the Laboratory of Neurosciences at Princeton University. In this lab, the team studies attention and cognitive control. Does the practice of meditation help to increase the ability to concentrate? This is the question that scientists are trying to answer. The experiment is built around two meditative states, focused attentional and open presence. Open presence is a very profound meditation technique as practiced in the ancient Nigma tradition. Okay. Okay, Matthew, we're ready to begin. Are you ready? Okay. classic test of, of attention is the Stroop task in which subjects view a word, but it's a color word, say the word red, only it's printed in a different color, say green. And the task is to name the color. So in this case I would have to say green, but it's very tempting, it's very difficult to override the tendency to want to read the word. Now, no matter how much practice within reason you give a ordinary individual on the Stroop task, they cannot get it to the point where they can attend to the color and name the color without being interfered by the word. 
One of the things that will be very interesting to observe is whether or not it's possible in a state of focused meditation, whether Mathieu can focus on the color and avoid the impact of the word and thereby reduce that cost. And um, if we can see that, you know, we're comparing his performance of the task in that state to a neutral state where he performs it just like you or I would. Mm -hmm. And if we see a difference, that, that would be a very interesting finding. It would suggest that indeed that practice of focused attention has given him a greater capacity for control or for selective attention than you or, you or I um, are, are able to achieve. Okay, Mike is that okay on your end? Very good. Uh, if you don't mind, we're going to just continue then with another uh, block of exactly the same task. Okay. okay. L'état de concentration, on appelle ça souvent la concentration en un seul point, tsechik tingnezing, en un seul, une, une seule pointe, on dit. Le contraire d'un esprit qui a des, des pointes multiples, c'est-à-dire qui va constamment à droite à gauche. Donc là, on va essayer de se concentrer, c'est tout à fait simple, sur un objet particulier. Alors, ça peut être un objet mental, mais dans ce cas-là ici, on demande aux méditants de se concentrer sur un objet extérieur. Dès qu'on est conscient qu'on a un peu euh, été distrait, on ramène simplement la concentration sur l'objet. Et on fait ça encore et encore. Et l'image qu'on donne, c'est comme un papillon qui, qui butine un peu sur une fleur, il fait un petit tour, il revient sur la fleur, et puis il fait ça plusieurs fois. Open presence, it seems like in, in many ways it's, it's the more important um, set of skills that they have and that I've become increasingly interested in trying to understand. And that is um, the ability not just to control attention, though this is probably a component of what I'm about to say, but it's the ability to control emotions and to maintain an emotional posture. Meditation also can mean analyzing. So just sort of turn back towards oneself and you know, look back. If, example, if you get very angry and then not always shouting at others or blaming on others, sort of try to look back. Where does this anger come from? What does it look like? Why is it so strong? Then naturally the anger becomes much softer and much gentler. And when anger becomes much softer, we become much more happier. So I think it's seeing from a different angle, not always from the one direction, but seeing from a different angle. There's a good, uh, uh, how do you say, example is given in the teaching is that if somebody hit you with a stick, normally we get angry at that person. But if you sort of analyze, there's three, there's a stick and the person and his negative emotion, his anger. So we don't blame the stick because it's, Use, the person is using the stick. Nobody gets angry at the stick, but we get angry at the person. But if you really think, that person is overpowered by his anger. So real our enemy is not the person, but his anger. So why we create another anger against another anger? Hello. Yes? Okay, give me one moment to think about that. Up to a minute 30 now? Yeah, so, no, so he's, he's asking for longer periods of time to transition. I was worried about that. Um, yeah, so... Gone from 30 seconds to one minute. Right, and he said for open presence, an extra 30 seconds would be beneficial. We brought up to a minute already? A minute, yeah. he asked just for. Now? Oh. Just now I added it, and he tried it at a, at, thir at a minute and thought, you know, if I could have a little longer, it's another 30 seconds. And what's going to add? It's going to add a Okay, let me just get set up and we'll get started momentarily. Le deuxième état méditatif, ce qu'on appelle la, la présence éveillée, en tibétain on dit « jikpa ». Là, ici, on essaie de rendre son esprit extrêmement vaste, ouvert, lumineux. On donne l'image comme, comme un ciel sans nuage, donc à la fois transparent, lucide, mais extrêmement vaste. Et on pense que l'esprit se mêle à ce, à ce ciel illimité, 
et que de ce fait, on devient, l'esprit devient libre de toutes les constructions mentales, toutes les élaborations mentales. Et bien qu'on n'essaie pas d'arrêter ou de bloquer les pensées ou les perceptions, néanmoins, on cesse d'être influencé par, ces, par, par les phénomènes, par les perceptions. On les laisse tels qu'ils sont. So I'm just going to show you the anatomy. We don't have. Yeah. Uh, you are going to look at, at the singular. Yes, exactly. So you can show me where it's. Well, I can show you. So that's from the, from the from the bottom up. So this is going to go like this. Or like this. Yes, from left to right. Left the structure right. of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so we're approaching the midline here. Uh huh. This right here, this dark area here, this is, is the, the cingulate sulcus. And what we're interested in generally is the cortex that surrounds the sulcus, um, the cingulate gyrus, and the area. Just so that's why when you do a narrow something, is manifested. Th this is what, what's believed, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, there are different versions of what what exactly causes the response. But this is certainly an area of interest for for these studies. If I'm performing a task, let's say the Stroop task, and you know, you asked me to, you know, again to say name the color, and um, I see the word again red and green ink, and I'm supposed to say green, but I say red. I go, oh! right now, I, I don't get really upset, but there's a little twinge, right, that maybe is the beginnings of an emotion that is there for a purpose. And we can measure, again, signals associated with that. Now, one of the questions um, that we've had about that brain area that seems to respond, or one of the brain areas that seems to respond when people trip up or actually make mistakes, is whether that area is responding in kind of a purely cognitive sense. There, there really is no emotion. I, I said I think it's proto-emotional, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a very dried kind of the way a computer would notice, you know, grading your exam by computer would notice you made a mistake. If, however, um, open presence is a state in which you continue to be able to perform cognitively, but you've adjusted or changed your emotional response, the actual experienced emotional response to those cognitive functions, then we might be able to see a dissociation in the response of these brain areas. So there's an opportunity here for us, in some sense, I don't want to sound too mercenary, but in some sense to exploit the, the um, ability that, that uh, a Buddhist adept or a, a, an adept um, meditative practitioner may have in establishing an emotional equilibrium at the same time that they're still able to perform a task to understand which parts, which parts of the brain are coding um, those possibly separate, though possibly the same um, functions. So I, I think there's a real you know, two-way street here. I mean, well, at least we have something to gain by working with the Buddhists. Sometimes I wonder what they have to gain by working with us. One, one thing for Buddhists, for us, practice, is to share with others. We're not into converting people. I think if you look in the Buddhist history, there's never been Buddhists being, um, going to other country and con try to convert people. But we share if uh, our, our how do you say, experience or things like that. So. Some many people they get interest uh, interest into Buddhist, so uh, we most welcome them. His son is Dalai Lama always say, "I'm when he travels to West, he always say, I'm not here to make one or two more Buddhists, but I'm just here to share share with you my experience." <laughs> So in 1990, I had the privilege to participate in the Third Mind in Life meeting and then uh, had the fortune of rooming with Francisco Varela. 
And in the context of that meeting where we're explaining the different emerging tools of cognitive neuroscience, and there was large interest in whether or not any of these tools could find application with advanced Tibetan practitioners. One late night, Francisco and I thought, we're all DEGers. Let's do something. Let's create a project. Let's actually try to do a field research project with these yogis who seem so inspiring. By the fall of 1992, we were able to actually uh, do a field research program uh, in India. And the purpose of that program was to identify senior monks and get feedback on the kinds of experiments that we would like to do in the future. The most important thing to the Dalai Lama who is interested in requesting that these yogis participate with us was that this project could be of benefit and that was also our motivation because in the West any tools that could be useful for eliminating stressful effects of the velocity of modern life would be very helpful and beneficial. When we got to Dharamsala, the senior shamatha practitioner told us, you cannot bring these yogis to your laboratory. You must bring your laboratory to them. So at that time, we had set up a, a, a laboratory uh, in a house that we had to essentially abandon. And we then began a series of interviews with advanced practitioners who had been in retreat for years in Neolithic uh, stone huts that many of them had built with their own hands. <laughs> We kept hearing several things. The most prevalent was, if you want to understand the mind, well, meditate. If the mind is colorless, odorless, it is a space in which phenomena occur, how do you measure that? Okay, so I'm going to give you a minute and a half, and it's going to look just like it did downstairs. You'll see the words neutral, focused, or open presence That's all fine, for yes. 90 seconds, mm -hmm. and then it'll be followed by the task. One of the precautions that we've just taken in today's session was to place an additional electrode on the muscle itself to determine whether what we're seeing is coming from the muscle which is part of the facial expression change that he has when he enters the open presence state or whether in fact it's a signal coming from the brain. All done? So I've got a question for you. You don't you don't adopt open presence when you're driving down the street or uh, <laughs> going to the post office. Well, I mean, uh, no, but certainly the idea is that there's no discontinuity in the end between the meditation and the daily life. So certainly, I mean, we say uh, experienced meditator they remain in open presence all the time. It's a kind of you know, the notion of flow. This is a very uh, fundamental and very profound and inner notion of flow, I think. If your meditation is one thing, your daily life is totally something else, then you know, it's nice to be to meditation, but uh, it's not really becoming integrating part of your mind stream. That means your mind has not changed.
The study of emotions has become central to the neurosciences. What are the mechanisms that regulate emotions? The hypothesis of the mind and life scientists is that the ability to regulate our emotions can change our character traits and is a key to happiness. The emotional training the Buddhists have practiced for 2,500 years not only attracts Western psychology, it challenges it. One idea that uh, I think has been in researchers' minds for a, a number of years has been whether or not the slope of the recovery is faster from an um, emotional episode as a function of um, meditative training. And one way to investigate that is to elicit affect and then look at its onsets and offsets. And that can be done by looking at physiology, at facial expression, and at other indirect measures like the uh, eye blink startle. So we present a slide for six or seven seconds, and four or five seconds after the onset of the slide, the startle probe may happen. In the context of experimenting with a Tibetan monk, the cross-cultural issues of slides that have been uh, normalized in a Western population was very problematic. For instance, this slide here is of chocolate ice cream balls, and this was not understood. This, to us, is very positive, certainly to me, um, but uh, this was not an object that was parsed by, uh, by the, the yogi who was looking at this. <laughs> when an emotion is aroused or triggered, we are usually not aware of the process by which it is brought to the fore. That is opaque to consciousness. We may be able to figure it out afterwards. I got afraid because of this, this, and this, but we don't start out being looking in on the appraisal process that brings forth emotion. It occurs automatically. It typically occurs in fractions of a second. Even the Dalai Lama says that he can't observe that. But what he can observe, or what you can learn to observe with a great deal of effort, is the arising of the impulse before you take the action. That also is usually very short in time. But the Buddhists focus a lot on that. Okay, Erica will talk to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Renee. Mm -hmm. We're going to start the first film now. Okay, Renee, I'm going to ask you to rate your emotional experience, and I'd like you to use a scale from zero to eight to tell me how much of each emotion you felt. Mm, zero to eight. Yes. So the first one is anger. Zero. Sadness. Four. Disgust. Two. Fear. Zero. Sympathy. 
six. This I didn't find so powerful in terms, because it's too located on parts of yeah. the body. So you don't Yeah, so, so you don't see the person. I think know? that the thing that's challenging for us as researchers yeah. is we want to find stimuli that will differentiate between people who would show a com mm -hmm. compassionate mm -hmm. response or feel a compassionate response mm -hmm. from those who might be less likely. There are certain shots where mm -hmm. you could feel there's a person there, mm -hmm. you know, but not mm -hmm. that much because it focused on the burn, mm -hmm. you know. On, right. on, so because this you, you, you show to a doctor, he doesn't get a yeah. normal reaction either. Mm -hmm. Right, because that's his profession, mm -hmm. or a butcher, mm -hmm. you know. And I, you know, just to give an example, right? So you, you wouldn't have any specific reaction. Mm -hmm. And a meditator, he can decide whether he doesn't have any expression at all. He, mm -hmm. he, uh, he, because if he focuses on emptiness, mm -hmm. he doesn't get any reaction at mm -hmm. all. Did right? you do anything like that prior to the film in terms of... Um, focusing your mind and... You're saying it's going to be graphic, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was expecting it, yeah. right? So yes, I prepared my mind, mm -hmm. you know, to not be shocked, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. Just for a little coding, did you see what he just did? Um, in facts, the facial action coding system, which is the totally comprehensive coding system developed by Paul Ekman and Wally Friesen that we were talking about before. Um, every visually distinguishable movement of the face has an arbitrary numeric code. Um, so if you lift the inner portion of the eyebrows, that's action unit one. Outer portion is action unit two, which is what he just did. Lowering them like that is four, and there are 44 different action units. He's dilating his nostrils, which is action unit 38. The rate of blinking has picked up, and that is something that we code. Um, not every researcher always codes blinks because they're so um, frequent, but it depends on the, the question you're looking at. What's interesting here is the lack of expression. When we show these films to um, college undergraduates, you get very, very intense displays of disgust, sometimes combinations of disgust and fear, things like and dramatic. And he's just, other than showing subtle signs of maybe concentration by like slightly tensing his eyelids. I'm not seeing anything. In San Francisco, the research project Cultivating Emotional Balance introduces school teachers to the practice of mindfulness. In this laboratory dedicated to health psychology, scientists measure how training in meditation can reduce stress and alleviate disturbing emotions. To that end, emotions are artificially provoked and their physiological expression measured. You know, one of the uh, hormones in the body that's most affected by psychological factors is cortisol, the uh, what's been called the stress hormone. And what we've shown is that it's not really a general stress hormone. It doesn't become activated. You don't get an increase in that hormone under all kinds of stressful conditions. And in fact, there is a very narrow range of conditions that really activate that system. Um, one of the most powerful of those is being in a context where you're being evaluated, so a kind of a social evaluation. And what it seems to be is that when somebody is threatened and thinks that others are going to view them negatively, um, that threat activates this system.
Remember to work as quickly and accurately as possible and speak clearly. Look straight into the camera and speak into the microphone and we'll begin at 2095 continually subtracting 13. Please look at the camera. Okay, 2095, 2082, 2079. Wrong. Please start again at 2095. 2095. 2082. 2069. 2056. Okay, we now have another task for you. Please count backwards starting from number 1097. 1097. Please focus on the camera. 1,070, uh, minus, what is the, minus 23. 1,097, 1,074, 1,051, 1,000. Let's see if it's steady. Thank you very much. Buddhists argue that the meditation and contemplative practice can actually reduce people's preoccupation or attachment with themselves. So it's really, really interesting to me to hypothesize or, or actually just really frame a question. Can a meditative, meditation type of training actually reduce a person's sensitivity to social self-threat? To rejection so that their systems, their cortisol systems, some of these other systems that we studied are not being activated as frequently and as a consequence people may actually have better health over time. Mindfulness med meditation, in my view, forces you to learn to pay attention to automatic processes. Breathing is automatic. You don't need to think to breathe. Walking is automatic once you've learned to do it. You don't need to think about taking steps in order to walk. Getting the food from the plate into your mouth. But in these practices, by making you focus on it, you're developing consciousness of automatic activity. In order to do that, you're building new, new, new neural connections that aren't there. My theory, and it's in the last few pages of uh, the second edition of Emotions Revealed, is that these new neural connections that you've constructed for monitoring breathing, eating, and walking will allow you to monitor the arousal of emotional impulses, which is also automatic. If you've made automatic functioning conscious, then you will be conscious of other automatic. We focus the attention on the tactile sensations of the passage of the breath at the apertures of the nostrils. Mindfully observe the sensations of the in-breath watching them closely. And as soon as you note that laxity or dullness is set in, immediately remedy that by arousing your attention, taking a fresh interest in the practice. On the other hand, if you find the mind has fallen into excitation, Distraction. Relax more deeply.
because you're attending to something, the tactile sensations of the breath. And the tactile sensations of the breath are not especially pleasant. They're not like a, an eight-course gourmet meal. They're just really ordinary. They're not unpleasant, they're not pleasant, they're very neutral. But the great discovery is that by attending to something neutral, that is itself not a stimulus, a pleasant stimulus, but by attending to it, cultivating and developing attention on this neutral object, happiness arises from awareness. This is a great discovery. project was one afternoon when we visited uh, the home of a yogi who spoke to us about the nature of compassion. He didn't want to have anything to do with our computers or our tasks, and we had what was a life-changing afternoon where uh, this geshe spoke to us and he then opened up about the possibility of emotion triggering this sincere wish to be of help to another being. But that compassionate action was not this sense of pathos for the suffering, but this skillful emanation of means to alleviate that suffering. And that afternoon, Richie sat down and said, I'm going to bring compassion into the lexicon of academic psychology. Yamtan is a Gamshan, a high practitioner of meditation. He lives in Bhutan, a Buddhist kingdom in the heart of the Oriental Himalayas. A number of other high practitioners have been tested before him at this laboratory of neurosciences of affect. At the University of Wisconsin, research focuses on compassion, a state of mind that has been neglected by Western psychologists. To Buddhists, compassion is a very central and complex meditative state that is not meant for beginners. Buddhists have developed a set of mind training procedures that are designed to increase a person's level of compassion. We've been trying to learn more about what the voluntary cultivation of compassion might actually do to the brain. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we have been using uh, both brain electrical activity measurements as well as functional MRI to look at changes in the brain during the voluntary generation of compassion. Did you ask him just to remain still again? Okay. And we're starting now.
Donc là, on leur envoie des, des sons qui ont une scène de valence. Ça peut être positif, négatif ou neutre. Et on essaie de voir, on compare la réponse du cerveau à ces stimuli euh, dans cet état de méditation et dans un état neutre sans méditation. Et on essaie de mieux, mieux comprendre comme ça l'impact de, de cet état méditatif euh, sur le cerveau. Someone had come from Tibet to meet His Holiness the Dalai Lama and who has spent, as many did, 15 to 20 years in jail and uh, went to, to torture many, many times. And uh, His Holiness asked him, you know, did you have fear sometime? And that person thought deeply and said, well, occasionally, my deepest fear was seeing that I might have felt strong hatred to those who were torturing me because that would have completely destroyed me. And then on top of being tortured and suffering so much, I would have no bearing about meaning of life, the, the quintessence of what I'm trying to do. And that would have been really the worst thing that could happen to me. So when I mentioned, when someone quoted that recently, there was a panel with French intellectuals. They said, ah, oh, that's despicable. This is just stupid resignation. How can you say that? You are, you are sort of excusing torture and everything like that. Well, again, th there's a complete difference between resignation and feeling compassion towards those who might torture you or other people, simply at looking that may all that which brought that in their mind, may that cease. May all the suffering they are flinging on others and occasionally on themselves too. Of course, it's the we cannot compare that, but still, may that cease completely. May those afflictive emotions be removed from their mind. So that is true compassion. So Paiula Yang Arang Sam Kang Chung Chung Chi Bambu Gi Kang Pa Chung Chung Chi Zo Song Deni Arang Dilla De Song Deni Kala De Song Pa Ma Gi Tre Deni Di Da Bu Deni Ngon Do Tun Si Ji Yi Go Zong Ne Deni Cha Deni Ngon Do Cha Do Sem Ke Men Dal Yik Ja De Su Chang Ma Ma Tang Char Song เออลามันเนี่ยจุดตั้งมาส่งอินะชาบุ้มเตจีที่กูดับดูส่งที่กับละเดินผ่าบาร์ซัมลาดูที่คอร์เดอร์ชินเซคันกัดชิจีกัด
The issue is how do you extend that? Clearly, some people do without any kind of Buddhist training whatsoever. I go back to my nurses, some doctors, some emergency room people, some ambulance teams. But for most people, the circle of compassion is fairly small. And it is um, something I don't think we know as to how we can really extend that. And can we expect everyone to become compassionate to, as the Dalai Lama puts it, to all sentient beings? What we found is that among the adept practitioners, uh, there were uh, changes in the brain in a particular frequency of the brain called gamma. And gamma is a fast frequency oscillation that is associated with activation of networks in the brain. And what we found is that there were specific networks that were activated, and they were activated in synchrony. And um, we were looking at networks in the prefrontal cortex as well as in the back of the brain called the parietal cortex. And um, those areas were highly activated and synchronized during the generation of compassion. Nyamlenshi This happened in my life 14 years ago, and now there's actually continuity from this in the form of a project that takes the lessons from this experience and makes it much more tractable scientifically. Uh, and with Alan Wallace, we've embarked uh, on essentially uh, a second generation of this research effort called the Shamatha Project. The neurobiologist Francisco Varela, who died in 2001, was one of the first to install a dialogue between Buddhism and science. He wrote, In my lab in Paris, I conduct experiments on the mental phenomenon of awareness, which is a very ordinary mental activity in everyday life. During these experiments, it is necessary to distinguish between those people that act naturally and those that have actually been trained in mindfulness meditation. These two categories give different results. The ability to observe the experience from within has become crucial to science. Herein lies the revolutionary potential that has come out of the contemplative traditions which form our universal heritage.
Wilt u dvd's bestellen van onze programma's? Bel dan 040 282 0022. Als u meer wilt weten over onze uitzendingen, vraag dan de gratis programmagids aan op nummer 035 677 1611. Of kijk op www.boeddhistischeomroep.nl.